So this is lecture five of ECE 5312. So in the last lecture, what we looked at were ways of protecting our information and making it compact enough to transmit across a medium in some sort of efficient manner. Um, and that's pretty much what we're going to look at. Um, like, you know, like source coding and channel coding, that's probably the only time we're going to be looking at it, this in this course, right? Because those are their own respective courses. If you take an image processing course, you're going to look at tons of different types of source encoding ways. If you take an information theory course, you might look at a, quite a few different types of channel coding techniques. What we're going to do now is this lecture, we're going to look at modulation. So this is the step where what we do is we, we, we have the, um, essentially we do the, bin uh, the, the source encoding, the channel coding. We're still in the binary domain. But I do not wish to send that information over the air in a binary format. I want to eventually exploit the properties of electromagnetic fields and waves in order to communicate information from one point to another point, right? Point A to point B, right? So what we want to do is essentially take all that binary information and map it to essentially a signal representation, right? So, um, so what ends up happening is uh, we, we take all that source and source encoding and channel encoding, we just lump it together, we call it a binary source, equivalent binary source, and forget about it. What I now want to do is I want to take the message bits, MB, which is a sequence of bits, and map it to a symbol, right? And that's what we call modulation. And so what we, the only thing is, this course is kind of interesting. We're going to be looking at both of these, okay? So Neil brought up one thing already, which is, like, when we talked about Shannon capacity, that was going to be in an AWGN environment. We're going to be looking at AWGN. So what I was talking about before, like, you know, random processes, random variables, and everyone's worried, oh, my dear, I don't remember what the Cauchy distribution looks like and characteristic functions. Don't worry about it. All you really need to know, like what we looked at in the very first lecture, is a very small subset of random variables. Gaussian, maybe uniform, Bernoulli, Poisson, exponential, right? That's all you really need to know. And at a very minimum of those, you really just need to know Gaussian. Because that's how we model that unwanted signal that's introduced to our transmission, right? The other thing that we have is something called band limited, right? And I'll describe what band limited is. It's not, the channel essentially, even though we're trans, trying to transmit a signal that might be this wide in bandwidth, we actually only have this much flat bandwidth available in the channel. And so the edges get distorted. It's band limited. We're only getting a certain portion across, and the rest is being corrupted, being attenuated, being, being messed up with in, in, in not such a great way. So what we're going to do is, what is this AWGN uh, channel business all about? So again, we go back to our drawing pad. And so what an AWGN channel is all about is, let's say you have your transmitter. We have our channel. And we have our receiver, right? So this guy sends signals over the air, dee, 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 dee. Um, goes through this medium, um, depending on what it is, right? So this course doesn't, even though I use wireless a lot and everyone thinks wireless is cool, um, in all seriousness, you know, when I'm at home, like this is more, I'm not sure if this is too much personal information, I actually prefer wired Ethernet over wireless any day. It's fast, it's reliable, and somehow it's slightly better in terms of getting bandwidth than, let's say, wireless, especially when the wireless router is at one point in the house and my office, my home office is all the way to the other end, right? But we can model, let's say that's a receiver, so this guy can be the air if it's wireless. This guy could also be a network of copper wire, right? So suppose you have uh, coax cables, right? Old school. Let's say we talk about really old school Ethernet. So let's say you have copper, okay? And so that's a wired type of network. What happens is it's kind of interesting. I'm going to draw in a different color. So let's say you have one input in your house, 
right? And that's a terminal and connects to the device. And then let's say it, it, that copper medium is shared with other signals. So there's a T joint. This goes to another room and another terminal. And then let's say down the way, oh, it connects over there. And then, oh, by the way, uh, here's another terminal. And then all of this then goes out to, let's say, some network at some uh, telephone switching office or something like that. Now, so let's say this, oh, I'm going to use, this is at your home or your office, right? So you basically have four jacks, and they're all kind of, like, again, sort of old school. They might use different frequencies. And they, they're all using a copper medium, but maybe frequency-wise, they might be separated from each other, so they all can coexist. But what's the problem here? So how many people here have taken transmission, uh, have seen transmission line theory in Smith charts? A little bit, right? Frightening what happens when you have, let's say, some sort of modulated signal, and it's propagating, then you hit a T joint, right? Like, because then what happens is if you don't choose your lengths properly, you get reverberations, there's reflections. Let's say one of those guys suddenly turns off the impedance, right? That beautiful Z looking into one line. So let's say I, from this, from the perspective of this guy's jack looking into the rest of the network, what is the impedance that he sees? And now, from this perspective, what's the impedance there? And what's the impedance all over the place? And then, let's say one jack then gets disconnected, and now it's open. So it's, all, it's you know, it, it looks like it's connected to air. It's an infinite in resistance. The impedance changes the entire network. It's time varying. So wired networks are still subject to vibra uh, reverberations and stuff, reflections, changes in impedances, and that changes the propagation characteristics, right? Oh, I love that stuff. Too bad we don't, how, how many people have used the Smith chart in the last five years? Ah, oh, good. Oh, uh, very good, very good. I love Smith charts. They're very expensive in the old days, but. So what happens is copper is one, fiber optics, oops, wrong color. Fiber, optical fiber. Um, underwater. So it's also wireless. People have looked at wireless communications underwater, different medium, very different properties, right? But what happens is whatever you look at, the channel is basically when your signal is let loose from the transmitter and tries to make its way to the receiver to be intercepted successfully. And depending on what you're transmitting across, it could be very different, right? In this case, in this case, we're going to look at something very simple to begin with. The channel that we're looking at, here's our transmitted signal S of T. That's from the transmitter. Our receiver receives R of T. And then there's this pesky signal N of T. N of T, if this is an AWGN channel, What this means is that um, N of T essentially is Gaussian. It might be have might have some mean mu. It might have some variance sigma squared. And if it's white, what do we know about its autocorrelation? Its autocorrelation function. So let's say that is R N of tau is a delta. It's, it has, it's absolutely not correlated. It's independent of every other sample that's produced by that guy. What's the Fourier transform equal to? The Fourier transform, folks, is the power spectral density. And it's flat. It turns out that the power spectral density of the noise is going to be flat and not over 2. Right? So we saw this before. We actually saw it in today's quiz. So this is the channel that we're going to be like once we go through all the modulation schemes um, in the next lecture and the lecture after that, we're going to actually say, OK, I have this format of information packaged as this type of symbol. How immune is it? How well does it perform when I do that? And that can also change. The intensity of the noise, the amount of energy that's contained in that noise, could cause a lot of problems. Like for instance, like, you know, first of all, there's 
Is it zero mean or is it non-zero mean? But the other thing is the variance. The variance, if there's a high variance, the noise is pretty bad. What do I mean to say? So what happens if I have, I'm going to try and draw in real time because I'm not going to open up MATLAB. So suppose I had noise and had very low variance. And let's say it was zero mean. How is it going to look like? Right? It doesn't vary much from the mean. So let's say this is the zero value of amplitude. And the points stay very close to the mean, right? Because the distribution should look, here's zero, should look like that. It should only deviate a little bit. What happens if the variance is huge? So suppose I have something that looks like this, right? Very large variance, right? Still zero mean. So now, OK, so what? I have a lot more squiggles than before. So what happens if I transmit a signal that looks like this, right? So let's say that's obviously a 1. That's a 0. That's a 1. Let's just, just, just for fun. And then I transmit it through something that, so that's my S of t. That's my N of t. My R of t could potentially look like, it's exaggerated, yes. But what happens is, you and I, as human beings, our computers can say, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a 1, that's a 0, that's a 1. Tell that to your receiver, right? Your receiver doesn't have a brain, right? Your receiver is just saying, above 0, it's 1. Below 0, below zero it's 0, right? Well, what about that? Above, one is, above 0 is 1, below 0 is 0. You and I can interpret it. And so there are a lot of tricks that we can work around. Another part of this course where we talk about receiver structures and strategies where we counteract the effects of noise like this, right? So it's one part choosing the right modulation scheme. It's also one part also choosing receiver structures that enhance the signal, try to sort of mitigate the effects of the noise and distortion so we can make a better decision at the receiver, right? All right. So that's how our AWGN channel looks like. And again, everyone should have seen this before. Okay, the autocorrelation. In reality, correlation noise can be graphically represented by, like you know, this this lump of 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 a shape. But if it's white Gaussian noise, and it implies absolutely no correlation. Theoretically, it should be a beautiful delta, right? In real world, like, do you actually have AWGN conditions? Mm, not totally, but it's possible. But you'll, you'll get something that looks rather pointy, but it won't exactly. You won't turn on your spectrum analyzer or whatever sort of equipment and see a delta on the screen. That, that would be pretty scary, right? Like, you know, in real comms, you, you, you'll be lucky if you get something that looks kind of like the top curve over there. So, what is the power spectra density of the white noise? And I told you already, it's n naught over 2. It's that flat spectra, which we actually looked at at the quiz. And we know that the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density will give us the autocorrelation function, which is a delta at 0, right? If so here, what's kind of cool is, let's suppose we now take that um, that power spectral density and pass it through an LTI system, like what we talked about before. What you get is shaped noise at the output. So, so we, we talked a little bit about this before when we had narrowband noise, right? So let's revisit that just one more time. And so what we have is, if I have my input to some filter, H of t, and suppose that's n of t, and I have w of t. So let's say n of t has a power spectral density that is flat across all frequencies. And this guy has a transfer function that happens to be, looks like this, from minus fc to fc. What ends up happening is, SW of F, my power spectral density at the output, essentially should take the shape of this guy, assuming he has a, un a unit height, 
minus fc, fc, and n naught over 2. Okay? So just, it's almost like a repeat of our quiz. And so when we have that, um, that actually comes up. Because what ends up happening is at a receiver, what you normally want to do is you only want to focus on the portion of the channel that you're looking at with your wireless device that you're going to be doing your decoding, your processing. Because the more you look out there, the more you have to process. It's not efficient. Wideband receivers kind of get more expensive. And you also bring in more noise. Why do you need to look at such a big spectrum? All you really want to look at is the signal. And you take a small penalty. You take in just a little bit of noise in what you do filter through. So you might say, where do I get that, professor? How do I get that into the receiver? Well, what ends up happening is, suppose you have as an input now, so let's say this is your receive filter, but now you have the receive signal we usually model as S of t plus n of t. That's what happens. What happens is, suppose, suppose our signal fits the bandwidth, and this is like sort of that ideal filter, right? And our ideal filter looks like that. And let's suppose our signal fits between minus fc and fc. But the noise doesn't. So what ends up happening is the S, st is fine. Like perhaps if it does, let's say it's not ideal, we might be cutting off its tails. So we might have s naught of t. But the noise is filtered noise. Okay? And so that's, the, that's basically what comes out. So let's say our original signal, that S of t, let's suppose it looks like this and, let, and, and dies down. And this filter would basically cut it off, so it would not be perfect, right? But the noise that's on, on top of it spectrally would be truncated to basically the size of this filter. And so this is what we would have to deal with at the output of that filter, and that's what we would be processing. So this is the AWGN channel, and we're assuming that everything's nice. We have no real constraints on bandwidth until we hit the receiver. So our signal, even if it's truncated, most of the signal is contained within band, right? And the noise? The noise is flat within band. The band limitedness, different story altogether. So somewhere along the lines, I think like a band limited channel and such, our signal, like actually let's let's actually go to the slide for that. So our signal for the band limited channel is something more like this. So what you've got is you have your original signal, your SI of T. So it's some symbol, SI, like it represents the I, it's an ith symbol. And it has, a, it has a frequency representation like this. Suppose that the channel is not just noise. Let's say, actually, the channel acts like a filter. right? And a certain bandwidth will pass no problems, nice flat frequency characteristic. But then outside of that begins to attenuate. So let's say it's represented by this middle plot here. right? And so you might notice that the bandwidth okay, is, is actually quite, quite a bit narrower. What, what ends up happening is if you pass it through a band-limited channel, then you add your noise. What you've done is you've distorted your signal. So, what, so what, what this is is so you have the AWGN noise. It's omnipresent. And then what you've got is you have a channel that contains a filter, and it could represent the reverberation in this room. Remember when I talked in the last class about how we can have like a multipath fading channel or some sort of influence, like basically represent, let's say, this room, the city, downtown New York, um, the tunnel in a subway as like, you know, the reflective characteristics, the propagation characteristics of our wireless signal as it makes its way from the transmitter to the receiver we can represent that as a filter. And then the noise is on all the unwanted stuff, the solar radiation, the vibration of the metal within the transmitter and receiver metal parts, like the antennas and stuff, the thermal noise, and all these other things that influence our signals, superimposed on top of that. So the first, well, after we do the modulation and we talk about power efficiency and the different types of modulation schemes, and then we derive the probability of error 
for AWGN, we're then going to look at in the next part of that class after that, the beautiful part of band limitedness and how do we counteract for that distortion. All right? So, so the band limited noise is really bad, bad news. And so what we, in, in practice, reality, when we have just an AWGN channel, just means that we, we might have a band limited channel, but our signal actually fits in the flat region of it, spectrally. So to, from its perspective, it looks like, hey, everything's nice. All I have to worry about is the noise. There's no band limitedness because it's not being distorted. It's far away from the distortion. It's distortionless, right? But if you look at the previous slide, you have this, like, let's say this bandwidth, right? Um, like, uh, uh, like um, yeah, so, so let's say here's the ticks that indicate where your, your frequency of your channel is, but this is the actual transmission, and then you feed it through the channel. What happens is this part here and here gets truncated. You get this guy. Obviously, that's going to cause problems later on, right? And there are a few techniques that you can do, including things like equalization. Oh, yes, this course talks about um, very, to some extent, about equalization. Um, although if you want to do like more fancy types of equalization, such as like LMS and such, there are other courses like adaptive signal processing that actually talks about. But this course, we're going to talk about things like zero forcing type of equalizers and, and as well as things like um, um, partial response, um, uh, sorry, um, pre-coding and, and the like. Okay, so that concludes lecture five. All right. I just love recording these things. Okay. Okay, so we are kind of ahead of